Hello, and thank you for joining us today. Virex Animal Health, manufacturers of Prevail and Rescue Disinfectants, is thrilled to offer this webinar answering your questions about COVID-19 and your pets. Rescue and Prevail Disinfectants do carry the emerging pathogen claim, demonstrating effectiveness against COVID-19. I'm very happy to introduce our three presenters today, our three experts, Dr. Pisano, Dr. Berliner, and Dr. Sikora. And without further ado, thanks very much. Thank you so much to Virox for hosting this. And as you can imagine, as a pet owner, we've been getting so many questions from you about how COVID can be transmitted and all those things that you have to worry about with your pets and with your own health. So we put together those frequently asked questions. And I wanted to introduce Dr. Berliner from the Maddie Shelter Medicine Program at Cornell University Veterinary School and Dr. Amelia Sakura from the Maddie Shelter Medicine Program at the University of Florida. And she's our shelter medicine intern. And we're going to go over those common questions and answers. So I wanna introduce Dr. Sakura. Thanks, Dr. Pisano. As a pet owner and a veterinarian, I'm really excited to be chatting with Dr. Berliner today regarding this topic. I think I'm not alone when I say it is overwhelming the amount of information we receive on a daily basis regarding coronavirus. So I'm really excited to tease through all of this today. So I think jumping in, I think it's important for us to address the current thoughts of transmission. So Dr. Berliner, how is coronavirus transmitted to humans? Great question, Amelia. And I think this is a really important one for people to understand. The biggest risk of transmission for people is other people. So this virus really prefers to be in humans. Um, although there's a lot of coronaviruses in animals, this one in particular has mutated to prefer people. And so the biggest risk for human to human transmission is either direct contact, aerosol, Exposure, meaning somebody coughs and then there are droplet particles um, that get transmitted to another person or fomite transmission. So things like doorknobs, grocery cart handles, um, that sort of thing. And so that is the reason why social distancing is so important in this pandemic, that by increasing the distance between people, we actually minimize the chance of transmission. Sure. So the CDC feels really strongly at this point that animals do not serve a role in the transmission of this virus to people. And so that is a really important point. Um, our, our animal family members may be at risk of essentially getting some virus from us, although that's very rare, but we'll talk about that I'm sure today. Um, but the animals themselves do not appear to serve a role in the transmission from, to, from people or to people. Okay, so could we just, dive in a little deeper with the transmission between humans and dogs specifically how and then humans and cats mm -hmm. how we might be spreading it to our animals yeah that's a great question too so we have very few examples of transmission of covid to dogs um, we have a couple of reports out of hong kong where dogs tested positive on pcr and then potentially um, developed antibody response to the virus um, and so, and then we have a couple of experimental studies that have really demonstrated that, that the virus doesn't like to be in dogs. Um, and so we feel pretty, pretty confident that dogs are not going to play a major role in this and may in fact be what we call a dead end host, meaning they may get a little bit of virus, but the virus doesn't really like to be there and therefore doesn't thrive and, um, and doesn't potentially even serve a risk to other dogs. And so dogs seem to be a much lower risk category for us at this point. Cats are the ones that, um, that we've seen a bit more on, right? And so if you've been paying attention to the news, um, we initially had a cat that developed illness in Hong Kong um, and then was tested and was positive for COVID. So there was um, some concern that that cat did contract COVID from the owner. Um, we're not completely sure that the clinical signs that cat demonstrated were due to the virus, but, but it's a concern. We have an experimental study where cats were given a very high dose of virus and then put in a room with other cats and it did seem to spread in that room with that very high dose. It's important to note that was experimental and may not completely reflect what can happen in cats in the world. 
Um, and then, and, and so these sort of cat studies have concerned us for sure. Um, we still have no evidence that cats serve in the transmission of the virus. So I wanna emphasize that again, and the CDC continues to emphasize that. But we do have some concerns that they may be um, a species that the virus likes better than dogs, but not as much as people. And so there's some concern that we could infect our cats based on those very small numbers. Now, it's also important to realize that we have a lot of cases in the US um, and not a lot of instances of cats becoming ill. I think the other one that's gotten a lot of tension is the tiger at the Bronx Zoo, um, who tested positive for the virus and is displaying clinical signs. And so that's the only case in the US that's been reported in, cat, in a cat at this point, and that's a big cat. Um, and so, especially given the numbers of pet owners um, that we have and the numbers of cats that we have in the U.S., which is somewhere around 60 million living in homes, um, the concern is a small concern, but it's, it's one that we need to pay attention to. Sure. That's great. You did mention that the transmission can be due to fomites. Do you uh, believe that pets can serve as a fomite, a.k.a. can they carry the virus on their fur? It's another good question. The CDC also feels strongly that pets are, do not carry it on their fur or not in a way that is clinically relevant or could pass disease. Um, theoretically, we all worried about that, right? It seems like it could be possible given that we know that the virus lives on surfaces, things like stainless steel or plastic. The virus can live there for up to three days based on studies. Um, and it can, it can even live in the air if it's coughed and aerosolized for probably a couple of hours. And so there were concerns very early on that pets could act as fomites um, and essentially carry it on their fur. But we don't have good evidence that that's true. And so the CDC feels pretty comfortable saying that that is not, not a big concern. Um, and even so much that they changed the recommendations. Initially, we in shelters, we were talking about bathing dogs and cats if they came in from known COVID exposed homes. Um, and the CDC and ABMA and shelter veterinarians have dialed that back. Uh, and at this point, we don't feel that bathing is necessary in most scenarios. It's certainly not necessary if they're coming into a shelter because we have other sort of things in place and we're not particularly worried about them carrying it on their coat. The other thing to know is cats are great at grooming themselves, right? So truthfully, they probably groom anything that gets on them off in a re relatively rapid period. And so it's another reason why we don't particularly feel we need to bathe the cat, which I would actually never want to do. <laughs> so if I can avoid that, I was very excited when we didn't have to talk about bathing cats. Yeah, that's great information. Okay, so moving into a scenario that I've seen come up on social media mm -hmm. or just from family and friends. So if I test positive for COVID-19, who should care for my pet? Great question. So there's a couple of different um, ways to break down this scenario, right? And so if you test positive for COVID-19, ideally your pet stays in your home. Ideally you're caring for yourself at home or family members are caring for you. And, and ideally someone else could care for your pet because we do worry about passing this to our dog and cat and ferret um, and potentially hamster family members. Um, and I'd like to pause here for just a second um, because our pets are family members, particularly in our culture. And so the AVMA survey of pet owners, 85% of dog owners consider their dog a family member. 75% of cat owners consider their cat a family member. Um, why it's a little bit lower for cats, I think, is because we have outdoor cats and potentially a little bit more complicated. So we're not we're not um, saying that cats are any less important as family members. But when I think that that is so important to remember as we think about how we work with our pets during this time. And so just like if you tested positive for COVID-19, you would limit your contact with your human family members. You need to limit your contact with your pet family member and essentially protect them. So um, CDC recommendations for people in their own home, maintain distance from your family members, wash your hands frequently. Um, for humans, you try to not share a bathroom or something like that where there's a lot of um, intermixing of people as they go in and out. So there's an element of maintaining distance, um, washing your hands a lot, 
potentially, if you're symptomatic and coughing, wearing a mask when you, if you do have to work with your pets and seeing if somebody else in the family can essentially become the primary caretaker. Okay. Okay. Now, if you need to leave your home, so let's say you've tested positive for COVID-19 and now you need to be hospitalized, that's a, that's a trickier question. And so as shelter veterinarians, we've looked at this a lot um, because we really want to enable pets to stay in their own homes. That is the best place for them to be at this time. Shelters are really switching over to emergency only functions. And although they can act as an emergency, um, care facility for pets, they shouldn't be the primary option. And so if your pet can stay in your home and someone else can provide care, that is generally our first plan option, okay? Um, because it means, number one, the pet isn't being transmitted somewhere else that could be stressful to them. And it means, two, they're not taking various items out of the home that may act as fomites. Um, for the disease. And so we've got some guidelines that have been put out. The AVMA and the CDC have some guidelines around caring for pets. Um, I wrote up a list of recommendations kind of based on thinking through this problem. Um, and so if that pet can shelter in place and someone can come to the home safely, and especially if it's a cat, for the first three days, if you kind of put food through the door, um, make sure there's adequate litter boxes um, and, and that sort of thing. That's probably the best case scenario, right? If a dog can stay in their home and just be walked a few times a day, that I think is the best case scenario. The biggest risk in that scenario is entering the home itself. And so that means kind of minimizing um, your chance of exposure if you have to enter the person's home. That is the point that we worry about because we're really worried about the fomites in that home, not necessarily the animal as, as a fomite. Does that make sense? Yes, definitely. And so, and so you answered my next question. Okay. Oh. <laughs> just per, no, it's great. Um, just segueing into it, providing mm -hmm. care for the pet in the home of a COVID positive individual. If you could go through breaking down cats, dogs, and then maybe pocket pets, I think that would be really helpful. Great. And so, as I said, avoid entering the home if at all possible. For cats, this is fairly easy. Okay. So you can go up to the door, bring the food, bring the litter, kind of slide things in. They're going to be happier in their home. You're not going to be exposing yourself to fomite transmission from surfaces in the home. Um, and, and it's probably the most humane option. The CDC is actually recommending that in shelters, we um, try to minimize close contact with animals for up to 14 days. That is a abundance of caution model that is like the absolute safest safest probably we could dial that back but we're not going to until we're absolutely safe. and so if that cat can stay in the home for the time that the owner is hospitalized or out of the home that is ideal dogs are a little trickier because they need to be walked um, and they need probably additional care if possible if they'll come to the door and they're highly social um, they know you your friend um, that they've met before, that's all the ideal scenario, then leashing up the dog, taking it outside for a walk, um, and then returning it to the home would be my first choice. Um, obviously, maintaining that you're going to hand wash, use hand sanitizer, you're going to sanitize the doorknobs, you're going to sanitize any surfaces you may touch in the home. Similar to all the items that the CDC recommends for people caring for people, okay? Same sort of scenario. Um, that would be my first choice. And I think it's probably the first choice for the animals. For pocket pets, again, you're gonna to have to enter the home for them. I don't think any fairy animals are gonna to come to the door for you. Um, and so there's an element of being really careful in that, right? So watching what surfaces you touch, potentially wearing protective outer garments that you take off, all the sorts of things that the CDC describes for um, taking care of someone in your home. Um, and if, and I would essentially give those animals multiple days of care, on day one. So let's stock them up so that you can minimize the time you enter the home and the numbers of times you have to go back. Again, most um, most surfaces, the virus will die within three days. And so if you can figure out kind of a minimal point of contact for three days, that's the safest scenario for you. That's great, great info. And you kind of touched this as well, touched on this as well. What measures can someone take to prevent exposure if they are entering 
a home with a COVID positive individual, which mm-hmm. I think you already went through these, but if you want to highlight any of them. Sure. So in terms of PPE, as you know, there's a shortage nationally of PPE. We need to be really wary of overusing PPE mm-hmm. because our human counterpoint counterparts in human medicine desperately need that equipment. And so in shelters, we've looked a lot at what can we reuse um, or what can we wash because there's no need to use single use items in really any of these instances. So personal protective equipment, if I was entering the home, someone who was hospitalized this morning, and so I know I'm still within that window where the virus can live in fomites, I would wear something, some sort of outer garment over my clothes that I could shed when I leave the home. I would wear gloves and they can be dishwashing gloves. Even when I've gone to the grocery store, I've worn just regular old gloves, like winter gloves that I take off and throw in the laundry when I get home. And I see people doing that frequently. So it can be washable items. Um, You might want to wear a pair of shoes into the home and then change your shoes when you leave and just allow those shoes to sit for a couple of days as well. Um, depending on how recently it was or what I anticipate with the pet, if it, if I might have to go looking for them, that worries me a little bit more. I don't like the idea of people crawling under beds and, and really struggling, um, which is why, you know, for cats, just put some stuff down and leave. For dogs, it might be a little trickier. Um, and so that's the kind of personal protective equipment. I don't think that you need to go overboard in wearing um, disposable products or that sort of thing. Sanitizing all surfaces, touch, doorknobs, countertops, anything you're going to touch, you're going to want some sort of cleaner. And pretty much all of the cleaners um, will help you in this scenario. It doesn't have to be something um, extraordinary. And then washing your hands. I mean, how many times can we say that, right? But wash your hands 20 seconds, hand sanitizer after you wash your hands, sanitize your hand sanitizer bottle, right? (laughs) Those are all the things that are now becoming part of what we do every day. Yes, definitely. So how can someone remove a pet from an owner's home who is COVID positive if they want to care for it in their home? Yeah, this is really, this is really important. The first part of this, and I know we'll probably talk about this when we get to plans, but ideally this owner has already talked to you about being the backup plan for their pet. They've given you keys and they've signed an authorization form that gives you permission to enter their home and take care of their pet. And so we'll talk about, I'm sure, getting a plan, but that's all part of it. So ideally this is already set up. Um, If you are concerned about entering that home, which there are definitely risks to doing that in those first three days after someone has left it, I would certainly advise that you get some help. So like I said, shelters and animal control agencies are on on an emergency only basis and they are busy doing those emergencies. But animal control is the most experienced set of people out there who know how to go into homes and safely get animals out. This is what they do on a regular basis. And so if there are, it's hard to say because some scenarios will be fairly easy and others will be challenging. But if this is a challenging scenario or you have I would contact my local animal control, explain the situation. This is a welfare issue. This pet is in the home. Um, The person has been hospitalized. This pet needs care and work with them to minimize risk um, and to help this animal as quickly as possible. Uh, Again, you want to minimize time in the home. That's because of fomite exposure in those first three days. And then the PPE we've discussed. And in some cases, the animal may not know you. Um, I hope they do if this was a plan that you set up ahead of time. So again, often your animal control officers, your humane investigators, they are skilled at um, capturing animals who may be frightened um, or nervous or scared or less socialized. And so they may be the people who need to help in this. And at times it may be something that has to be staged, meaning they may go in, um, put down some food, check on the welfare of the animal and come back few days rather than taking the animal out of the home and you will essentially be their point of contact for when that animal is then able to be removed from the home. Does that make sense? Yes, definitely. So in the case that I get a COVID exposed pet and I am to care for it in my home, what are your recommendations? Mm-hmm. So recommendations are based um, on the CDC recommendations for pet owners and based on the ones for shelters. And so out of an abundance of caution, again, what we are recommending is that even though we don't believe that pet acts as a fomite, carries that virus, um, or serves as a high risk for you, 
that you do minimize close contact and interaction with that pet. Um, and so what that means for dogs and cats is that potentially they have a separate area of your home where they will be housed away from humans and away from your other pets. And that again is an abundance of caution model. But quite frankly, it's also what we often recommend in foster care scenarios and others so that that animal also has time to adjust to your home and isn't kind of thrown into a new scenario, which can be stressful for them. Their, their loving owner has disappeared in them. Now they're in a new place. And so truly separating them, I think, is both better for you in terms of mitigating any small risks there may be, and also better for that pet in terms of managing their stress in the new environment. Um, so minimizing close contact, we don't want to be snuggling with them, letting them sleep in our beds, um, and that sort of thing initially. And we're going to follow the abundance of caution model. It's really 14 days. Um, and so it, it's important to kind of think this through and know where you're going to house them um, and have made a setup for that. And then again, of course, washing your hands after caring for them, washing your hands after petting them, all the standard things that we would recommend in any scenario. Um, with a new pet in the home, or particularly in this scenario with COVID-19. Great. So just for clarification, we still are not recommending to bathe the dogs or cats when they enter. We're recommending to separate them. Easy question for cats. So I would yeah. not bathe the cat. <laughs> I would absolutely just separate them, let them groom themselves, give them the 14 days, let them hang out. Um, I pause on dogs, and this is you know, the standard recommendation shelters. We're not bathing dogs when they enter the shelter either. We are putting them in double-sided housing, minimizing close contact, and then um, wearing some minimum PPE and taking them out and that sort of thing. For dogs in the home, I only pause because I think it's sometimes harder to maintain that separation, um, both from the human side, because we want to snuggle them, and from the dog side, um, because a lot of times dogs tend to be more social with us. And so I pause and say that for dogs, I do think there are some specific scenarios where bathing a dog wouldn't be the worst idea, particularly if they're amenable to it. It's a small dog. It's easy for you to do, um, and you don't feel like you're going to struggle or anything like that. That is above and beyond any of the recommendations made elsewhere. But for me, if you think you're going to have trouble with that 14-day separation in your home, then a bath may be more good. Um, in that situation, I would prefer a bath over not a bath. And certainly you are going to have to handle that dog to walk them outside um, and that sort of thing. And depending on where you live, you may have to pick them up to do that, depending on stairs and that sort of thing. In which case, I would feel better about a bath if they're amenable to it. If you're going to struggle, they don't want the bath, they've never had a bath, um, that sort of thing, then it's not worth it. <clears throat> and so this is one where I don't have a perfect answer. Um, it really depends on the situation and the particular animal where you're having them and how much they're willing to be bathed. But I do think that there for some dogs that a bath is not a bad idea. Great. One question I've been getting from friends and family or seeing on social media is, what should I do regarding the medical care for my pet during this time, whether it's routine or emergency? Great question. So veterinary clinics are operating on an essential business only model and in some case emergency only model. And so most of them have some sort of social distancing set up at their veterinary clinics. So you can still contact your vet. And what usually will happen then is they will triage the situation over the phone. They will ask you questions about your own health. They will ask you questions about your pet's health. And then they will determine whether your pet truly needs to come in for an essential service. Um, in some cases, they may be able to offer telemedicine and be able to just see your pet over a video phone like this and then prescribe medication or recommend treatment that way. If it's truly an elective procedure, so something that is not necessary to be done right now, it's not going to change the outcome in the next one to two months for your pet, they're probably going to postpone it. Um, and there are quite a few things that can absolutely be postponed and not compromise your pet's health though or welfare. Um, if it is something that's essential and needs to be done, then they will tell you how to properly come to their clinic safely um, and practicing social distancing. And so most of them now have essentially curbside service, just like the grocery store uh, <laughs> and the food store. So um, you will communicate with them by phone, um, you will have some sort of drop-off system um, for your pet, and then you will communicate by phone again in the end, and they will send electronic 
records to you. And so clinics um, have scrambled to set these models up, but they're getting pretty good at it. Yep. Uh, so that's what you can expect is that business will not be business as usual, but you should still be able to access essential and emergency care for your pet. Great. So like you had already mentioned, my cats are my family. So should people have a plan for their pet like they would for their children? They absolutely need to have a plan for their pet. And I'll tell you what we're seeing already in the communities that have been hardest hit by the pandemic. So, you know, I'm, I'm in New York. New York City, um, as you know, is the epicenter at this point in the US um, and actually I think in the world. And so um, what we are seeing is that people are doing this. It's quite remarkable. Um, when I talked to Dr. Brennan yesterday, um, I believe only 10 pets had come in from COVID exposed homes in New York City to this point, which is quite remarkable when we look at the number of cases um, that they are experiencing. And so people are doing this, um, but it does take forethought. And a lot of us uh, in the US now have the opportunity because we've got a little bit of time until this is expected to peak in our community to go through this process. So you want to have a plan for your pets. This means identifying a family member or friend, ideally someone who is geographically located close to you. And um, one of the things we've been talking about is trying to do this as a group so that if your, fam your identified family member or friend is unable to care for your pet if the time comes, then there's a backup plan for them as well. And so groups of friends um, or family members are chatting together and coming up with plans as a, as a group. Um, obviously, if you have someone else living in your home, that's your first choice. Um, but if you don't, then somebody who's geographically close to you should should be that backup. Um, you want to make sure you prepare a go bag for your pet. And I kind of want to pause on this one for a moment because there's lots of pet disaster preparedness um, packets out there, checklists. The CDC has one, and they're they're long. And they often contain a lot of items which are more directed at natural disasters where you are evacuating your home um, and expected either to not come back for a long time or um, or potentially your home is going to be destroyed. And so because of because this is an infectious disease scenario, I do think that this go bag needs to be modified a little bit. Um, taking in mind that you don't want to keep fomites removed from the home and taken to somebody else's home. And so if you look at the go bag um, descriptions for this pandemic in particular, it tends to be much more focused than those long lists for natural disasters. And so things like medical record, um, two weeks worth of food, potentially a leash or some other you know, urgent care items, a carrier for your cat, and then um, a pet authorization form that allows you to, that says that somebody's allowed to care for your pet and make medical decisions for them. And we have examples of that um, that can be shared. And so it's really a relatively short list. It should be somewhere close to the door. And so somebody doesn't have to go far to get it. Um, and you also wanna make sure that your family member or friend has keys to your home so that they can actually access them if and when the time comes. Um, I do think that it's important that you have planned essentially for at least two weeks, although we know in this pandemic that people can be hospitalized longer than that. Um, but at least two weeks gives people time to get more, get more items for your pet, stock up on more food, et cetera. Another important thing is medications. If your pet is on particular medications that need to be administered at home, those medications and directions for those medications should be with that go back. Okay. Um, as an aside, if your pet is on treatment that is relatively extensive and you don't necessarily have a family member or friend who can do that sort of treatment, I'm thinking particularly of diabetics that need injections or that sort of thing, I would absolutely reach out to your veterinary hospital now to see whether medical boarding is an option for you. Chances are you probably have a system for that if you have a pet with that condition because if you've ever had to travel, they probably needed to either be boarded, medically boarded at a clinic, or have someone with medical experience come to your home and watch them, in which case you can also reach out to that person and make, and make them part of your plan. And then finally, we never like to think about it, but do you have a plan for your pet in the event um, that you are not able to come back to them? And so there are all sorts of systems um, for planning for your pet in your estate. Um, I have some of the most challenging animals as a shelter veterinarian. I have stocked my home with, we're, 
we are known as scratch and dent acres. Um, and my plan for my pet has existed long before COVID-19 because I need to know that if something happens to me, that people will take my broken animals. Um, and so I had long ago reached out to family and friends to make sure that my do most difficult pets have a place to go. Um, and so there is an element of making sure you've planned ahead for your animals because they are our family members um, and we want to make sure that they are provided. Yeah, they really are family members. And I know, again, you touched on this, and I think it's a really cool idea to make a go bag. And I recommend that everyone does this today. So could you just go over the essentials that we shouldn't forget? Food and medication. So two weeks worth of food and two weeks worth of medications. Um, and along with that, the medical record uh, so that you also know who is the veterinarian in the event that I need more medications or that the pet is experiencing a problem and I need it access veterinary care for them. A crater carrier for cats or small dogs, um, leash and that sort of thing um, for larger dogs, and then potentially litter or favorite treats. I would evaluate that these must be washable items. Um, so they need to be things that can be either wiped down and disinfected or immediately put in the laundry. Because if I am going to take um, fabric or that sort of thing out or plastic toys, remembering that COVID-19 can live on plastic. So if the owner has recently been in the household potentially handling these items, um, then I want to make sure these are all things that can be washed once they get to the new home. Again, hopefully you are putting this together before you become ill and you will never need it because you won't become ill, right? So there's nothing like having a plan you never need to enact. That is the goal. Yes. <laughs> so if you're healthy today, let's assemble this today and then let's hope we never need it. And I always feel like the way it works in the world, if you plan ahead, then you won't need it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I would agree with that. So just to kind of wrap things up, I think the silver lining um, with the coronavirus for me has been how many people have asked, how can they help? So how can people support their community, their friends, their family, and their pets during this time? Great question. So first of all, stay home, right? The more you stay healthy, the more the resources can be reserved from other people who really need them. And we all want you to stay healthy. So stay home if you can, if you are not an essential worker. Um, if you're able to foster, like Dr. Pisano just fostered a new dog yesterday and has a new dog in her home, if you're able to foster, reach out to your shelter and see if they need someone to foster a pet. And obviously, uh, this is a great time to adopt a pet um, if you're home, gives you some time with that pet um, when they initially come home, and it's just a great time to help shelters. Shelters are really, like I said, working on an emergency-only basis, and part of that is evacuating those animals into the community as quickly as possible. Um, and as humanely as possible so that we can minimize the numbers of animals in the shelter and really focus on our emergency role. Um, reach out to people, encourage them to make plans for their pets, encourage to be part of their plan for their pet. And so establishing those relationships and helping people think through what happens if I get sick, what happens to my cat, what happens to my dog, um, it's really important. Just reach out now um, and start to make those plans. Certainly, you can donate to your local shelter. Shelters need all the help they can get right now, um, for sure. One of the big items um, is also helping shelters help others. So pet food pantries are a big focus for shelters right now because obviously with how this has affected the economy, um, we want to make sure that pets are fed. And part of keeping pets in their homes so that they don't come to the shelter is making sure that pets are fed. And so a lot of shelters are reaching out for help to stock pet food pantries, whether that's through the shelter itself or whether that's through human food banks in the community or Meals on Wheels and that sort of thing. And so that's another big way that you can really help local shelters and help your community. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Berliner. The information that you gave today is gonna to be so helpful for pet owners, including myself. So I think I will turn it over to Dr. Pisano to wrap things up. Great, thank you both so much. What great information we have. And we do know that we have, so we are overwhelmed with all the information out there. We just distilled some very high level resources for you on this slide. And we will be posting this recording on the Virox website, on the Maddie Shelter Medicine Program 
websites at Cornell and at the University of Florida and on our Facebook pages. And I will post the recording on the Team Shelter USA Facebook page as well. And we want to just encourage you all. We are so grateful for you all as pet owners to be caring so much about your pets. Staying home right now saves lives. Flatten the curve. We need to do this together. We're all in this together. And we just wish everyone health and safety in the next coming months. And all the best to you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Sarah and Amelia. I really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank and you for all you do. Thank you to Maddie's Fund and to Virox as well.